Our lives take shape as we evolve through the life cycle. Embedded in our families and in the larger sociocultural context of our communities, our society, and our planet. For most of us, our families are the most important system we ever belong to. We are born into our families, we develop, grow, and hopefully die in the context of our families. They are the foundation of our first experiences of the world, our first relationships, our first sense of belonging to a group. Relationships with parents, siblings, and other family members go through transitions as we move through life. Boundaries shift, psychological distance among family members changes, and roles within and between subsystems are constantly being redefined. This video will offer a glimpse of this multi-contextual life cycle framework for understanding and assessing individuals and families. For the vast majority of people, our lives take place in the context of our family's life cycle and the social system surrounding it. Thus, the family's life cycle, embedded in its larger context, is the natural framework within which to focus our understanding of our lives and our human problems. Families are people who have a shared history and an implied shared future. They encompass the entire emotional system of at least three and frequently four or even five generations held together by blood, legal, emotional, and or historical ties. All our human experiences are framed by our kinship and social networks in the context of time. Until recently, therapists have paid little attention to the family life cycle and its impact on human development. Even now, psychological theories tend to prioritize individual development, relating at most to couples or parents and children in the nuclear family, ignoring the multi-generational context of family connections that pattern our lives. But our society's swiftly changing family patterns, which assume many configurations over the lifespan, are forcing us to take a broader view of both human development and family connections. The milestones of birth, marriage, childbearing, migration, and death hold very different roles in the lives of families in the 21st century than ever before. We are living longer, moving more often, marrying later, if at all, and having fewer children, but remarrying and repartnering are happening more often than ever in human history. Indeed, it has been said that childhood is a social construction, an invention of the 17th century, before which time there seems to have been no category of childhood as a special and separate time or phase of life. Adolescence has been called an invention of the 19th century, brought on by the Industrial Revolution, a prolonged launching phase, sometimes referred to as adult adolescence, the time when young adults need continued education and training before they can begin to support themselves and start their own families is thought to be a product of the educational requirements of our 21st century global economy. It is also often thought that women have only begun to have a life cycle of their own since the late 20th century. In 1900, the lifespan in the U.S. was 47 years. Right now, it has almost reached 80, and because we are on average having fewer than two children per couple, the longest phase of life is that when adults are still healthy but no longer involved in child rearing, a phase which was hardly known earlier in history. Another major change is that as a society that moves frequently, family members often live far apart. And the issue of community and what constitutes community is shifting rapidly, and family caretaking has become increasingly problematic. Overall, changes in family life cycle patterns have escalated dramatically in recent decades, owing especially to a lower birth rate, almost a doubling of life expectancy, profound changes in the role of women, the rise of unmarried motherhood, 
the rise of unmarried couples, increasing single parent adoptions, increasing LGBT, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans couples and families, increasing longevity with the implications of caretaking needs at the end of life, greater physical distance among family members, increasing work time, especially for women, high divorce and remarriage rates, increasing two paycheck marriages to the point where they are now the norm, and the changing composition of households to more single person households than ever before. Throughout most of human history, families tended to live in clans of extended families of 30 or 40 people. Prior to the development of the nuclear family, which seems to have been an invention of the industrial age, families lived in large community groups. There were usually three or more caregiving adults for each child under six, and there was little privacy. It was mechanized transportation and the need for concentrated groups of workers for factories and businesses that led to family groups becoming smaller. By 1500, the average household in the West had decreased from 30 or 40 to 20 people. By 1850 to 10, and by 2020 in the U.S. to less than three, with 28% of people now living alone. And child rearing, which used to involve parents throughout their healthy adult lives, now generally occupies less than half of adult life prior to old age. Even women who choose primary roles as mother or homemaker now face an empty nest phase that is likely to be longer than the years they devote to childcare. Family members have many more choices than they did in the past about whether or whom to marry, where to live, how many children to have, if any, how to conduct relationships within the immediate or extended family, and how to allocate family tasks. Our society has moved from family ties that were obligatory to those that seem voluntary, with an accompanying increase in ambiguity of the norms for relationships. Relationships with siblings and parents are fairly often disrupted by occupational and geographic mobility as families move through the life cycle. Even couples are increasingly managing long distance relationships. The meaning of family has thus changed dramatically and there are often no agreed upon values beyond child rearing by which families define their connectedness. Yet despite the fact that in our era, nuclear families often live on their own and at a great distance from extended family, they are still part of the larger multi-generational system, their past, present, and anticipated future relationships still intertwined. As a system moving through time, families are different from all other systems because they incorporate new members only by birth, adoption, commitment, or marriage, and members can leave only by death if then. Of course, family relationships often get stuck and people think they can cut each other off and they do so all the time. But from a systems perspective, we realize that we are all connected, so cutting someone off does not end the connection. When there is a divorce, we even have a name for the relationship with the previous spouse, an ex-spouse. But there's no such thing as a previous or ex-parent. Parenting is forever, even if people do not always live up to the concept. No other system is subject to these constraints. A business manager can fire members of his organization viewed as dysfunctional and members can resign if the organization's structure and values are not to their liking. In families, by contrast, the pressures of membership with no exit can, in the extreme, lead to severe dysfunction or even suicide. In non-family systems, the roles and functions are carried out in a more or less stable way by functional replacement of those who leave for any reason, or else the group dissolves and people move on into other systems. Although families also have roles and functions, their main value is in the relationships, which are irreplaceable. 
Still, the tremendous life-shaping impact of one generation on those following is hard to overestimate. For one thing, three, four, and sometimes now five different generations must adjust to the life cycle transition simultaneously. While one generation is moving toward old age, the next is contending with late middle age, caregiving, or the empty nest. The next generations are coping with the establishment of careers and intimate peer adult relationships, having and raising children and adolescents, while the youngest generations are focused on growing up as part of the system. Naturally, there is an intermingling of the generations and events at one level have a powerful impact on relationships at each other level. The important impact of events and relationships in the grand parental generation is routinely overlooked by therapists who focus only on the nuclear family. Indeed, human beings are unique for the role grandparents and other adults play in parenting. This supportive role is supremely important for our very survival as a species, as the extra caretaking provided by grandparents, aunts, uncles, and other adults is very protective for children's development. The powerful impact children have on adult development has also been ignored in the developmental literature. Children's role in changing and growing up their parents as parents respond to their children's unfolding lives is lost in a unidirectional linear framework, which ignores also the powerful role grandchildren often play in promoting their grandparents' development, just as grandparents are often a major influence on their development. Children are actually a major impetus for growth of all older generations. An example in terms of overcoming patriarchal values is a study that showed that having only daughters tends to impact fathers' feminist sympathies, and the more daughters they have, the more impacted they are. Far from being the one-way street that most life cycle formulations have offered us, our lives continually spiral through the multi-generational and contextual connections with those who come before us, those who go with us through life, and those who come after us. Another factor in human development is the impact of living in a given place at a given time. The cohort to which family members in each generation belong historically influences their worldview, their sense of possibility, and their beliefs about life cycle transitions. Each cohort is different, as social, economic, and political history of an era influences each generation's worldview differently from the views of those born at other times. We view the multi-contextual life cycle framework as the foundation for all clinical assessment. Every assessment must take account of the many overlapping contexts in which our lives evolve. We might begin with the individual level, the spiritual self, the mind or intrapsychic self, and the physical self or body. Next, we consider the immediate context around the individual, the family, kin, and community, the immediate family, the extended family, and the friendships, informal kin, and community networks. And then we must consider how all these contexts function within and are affected by the larger sociocultural context, the immediate cultural context a person and family lives in or is part of, the larger society, and the ecological system of nature and the geography of our world that embraces us. Now we have to consider that all people in these multiple contexts are always moving along through time. Nothing stands still, and these contexts are all always evolving. As people move through time, there are what we think of as vertical stressors that come down our individual family and sociocultural evolutionary tree. Poverty and politics affect us over the generations. Racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, violence, addictions, abilities and disabilities, 
emotional patterns of our families, culture, and society, myths, triangles, secrets, traumatic legacies, religious beliefs and practices, and so forth. Then again, there are what we think of as horizontal stressors, those that affect us as we move through our lives. First off, of course, are developmental changes. As we and our families and cohort move through the transitions of the life cycle. Then there are historical events, economic changes, politics, and other social changes that hit into our lives as we move through time. Thirdly, there are the unpredictable horizontal stressors, natural disasters, accidents, illness, migration, unemployment, and so forth, that we might think of as the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that may hit an individual, family, or community, or society at a particular moment. This entire context is the framework within which we must consider and assess a particular problem if we want to help a person and family address. Although all change is to some degree stressful, when the horizontal or developmental stress intersects with the vertical transgenerational stress, there tends to be a quantum leap in anxiety in any system. To give a global example, if your parents were basically pleased to be parents and handled the job without too much anxiety, the birth of the first child would produce just the normal stresses of a system expanding its boundaries. But if parenting was a problem in the family of origin, and that has not been dealt with, the transition to parenthood may produce a heightened anxiety for a couple. Even without any outstanding family of origin issues, the inclusion of a child may tax a system if there's a mismatch between the child and the parent's temperaments, or if a child is conceived at a time of great political or economic upheaval that forces the family to migrate, or if there's a pileup of stressors at the same time. Given enough stress on the horizontal or developmental axis, any person or family is likely to appear dysfunctional. On the other hand, even a small horizontal stress on a family in which intense issues are coming down the vertical axis are likely to cause great disruption to the system. Stressors on the vertical and horizontal axes are key determinants of how well families will manage their life transitions. It is therefore crucial to assess not only the current life cycle stresses, but also their connections to stressors that are coming down the family over time. For example, we found that a grandparent death close in time to the birth of a child was correlated with symptom development in that child at the time of launching many years later. Such findings support our clinical experience that the connections and at times misconnections and disconnections in families can be very far reaching. A clear reason to pay attention to life cycle patterns in order to understand the patterns around dysfunction even when they arise much later in the family's history. If emotional issues and developmental tasks are not dealt with, they're likely to become hindrances to future life cycle transitions and relationships. If young adults cannot launch and differentiate themselves from their families of origin, they're likely to get trapped in their family's dysfunctional patterns, impaired in their own life trajectory, and affected in their adult relationships with their own partners and children and beyond. If parents are not able to give up their control of their children, they will also be blocked in their development, as well as in stunting their children's evolution. We mustn't forget that our lives are always circumscribed by our social context, race, gender, social class, sexual orientation, cultural background, and migration history, as well as by the particulars of our family's relationships and functioning. This means we must consider whether our clients feel at home in their communities as they are going through their lives. Those who, for reasons of societal obstacles, oppression, disability, and other disadvantages, are not able to have a sense of belonging, rootedness, and safety, will always have a harder time than those who have the benefit of a solid sense of belonging as they move through life. At each phase of life, 
individuals and families need to transform their relationships to adapt to changing circumstances. Moving to a new phase requires a change of the system itself. Most life cycle phases pertain to entries and exits of family members and to the changes in members' caretaking needs, functioning, and relationships. Coupling and having children are, of course, the major life cycle phases of family expansion, while launching and death are the major phases of contraction. Families must renegotiate their relationships with each other and with others many times as they move through life. Family roles and relationships shift as parents move from raising and caring for children to managing adolescents to launching young adults to welcoming their children's partners and their families and then to caring for aging parents and other family members. Each phase requires major change in how the family is organized and how it functions. When families cannot adapt to the individual and systemic changes their life cycle requires, they may become stuck and their healthy development is likely to be blocked. When symptoms arise in a family, it is often a signal that there is a life cycle transformation blockage and that the family has gotten stalled in trying to make first order change, that is a rearrangement of the parts of the system, when second order change or a transformation of the system itself is necessary. Any assessment must explore where the family is in their life cycle process and whether current problems reflect the need for such transformational process to get them back on track. Each life cycle stage requires a basic change in how the family members relate, that is, the second order change of the system itself. Within each stage, there are many smaller changes, of course, which we refer to as first order changes or rearrangements of the parts. For example, Having a new infant requires a transformation of the couple's relationship to each other. To now include a brand new major caretaking role as parents. Sleepless nights, not much time for their own relationship when the child is in need, because children cannot survive unless parents prioritize, focus on caring for them. For a time at least, other aspects of the couple's relationship must be sidelined. Then, as children develop and perhaps siblings are born, there are many changes as children begin to crawl, walk, talk, and socialize. Parenting functions shift as children grow, but the rearrangement from couple to parent couple is a change requiring basic paradigm shift. The shift from one level of parenting to the next is more a shift in time, space, and particular parenting tasks, not really requiring such a complete change of the system itself. That is, we might say, until children reach adolescence. At that point, the essence of parenting functions changes. Children can no longer be managed physically and parents must find new ways to parent them beyond physical control. What you can do with a five-year-old who is not cooperating involves a completely different pattern of control and negotiation once children become too big to control physically. The next major change comes when children begin to launch and move out on their own. This phase again requires a transformation of the system as the task for growing children is to begin to take on adult responsibilities and parents need to back away from such caretaking and let their emerging adult children begin to take responsibility for their own lives. When children begin to choose partners to marry and to become connected to their partner's family, second order change is required again. That is, the basic system must change again as the family must expand to accommodate the addition of new family members, partners, and in-laws. This again requires an entire transformation of the system to incorporate the new and evolving extended family members. Also, parents' position in the family shifts in basic ways as they begin to recede from the center stage of the family and their children and children's partners take on a more central role in forming and reforming family traditions and begin to have their own children 
which adds a new dynamic to the system. And there is, as J.K. Rowling put it, an expiration date on hating your parents for whatever they did wrong and realizing that your life is your responsibility and what you do lies with you. As children leave home and begin to form their own families, their parents may feel in the middle between their emerging children and grandchildren and their aging parents and other family members. This phase in our time has become the longest phase in life, a phase when parents are usually no longer involved in primary child rearing, though their grandchildren may become key relationships for them as they may be for the grandchildren, as we have mentioned earlier. At this life stage, parents readjust to couplehood without child rearing. They refocus themselves, developing new life activities, realigning relationships with their own parents, and other extended family aging and dying. As parents, now grandparents, age and begin to need caretaking themselves, there is again a need for second order change of the system itself. The middle generations may be required to take over responsibility for family caretaking and all generations must deal with the transitions of aging, illness, and death. There is a realignment of relationships as late life family members retire and begin to need care themselves. Financial responsibilities and emotional relationships often shift as aging family members require additional supports. And finally, the death of grandparents and other older relatives requires the realignment of the family again with the middle generation now beginning to become the elders themselves. When life cycle experiences are not dealt with, they tend to become family secrets and travel down the family tree, often affecting those born even generations later. The philosopher and essayist Susan Griffin has written about her own family history. All that I was taught at home or at school was colored by denial, and thus it became so familiar to me that I did not see it. Only now I've begun to recognize that there are many closely guarded family secrets that I kept and many that were kept from me. When my father was a small boy, his mother did something unforgivable. It was a source of shame as many secrets are and hence kept hidden from my father and eventually from me. My great aunt would have told me this secret before she died, but by that time she could not remember it. I've always sensed that my grandmother's transgression was sexual. Whatever she did was taken as a cause by my grandfather and his mother to abandon her. They left her in Canada and moved to California, taking her two sons, my father and his brother with them. My father was not allowed to cry over his lost mother nor to speak her name. He could not give in to his grief but instead was taught to practice the military virtue of forbearance and to set an example in his manhood for his brother Roland. In this way, I suppose my grandfather hoped to erase the memory of my grandmother from all our minds. But her loss has haunted us. I do not see my life as separate from history. In my mind, my family secrets mingle with the secrets of statesmen and bombers nor is my life divided from the lives of others. I, who am woman, have my father's face, and he, I suspect, has his mother's face. There is a characteristic way my father's eyelids fold, and you can see this in my face, and in a photograph I have of him as a little boy. In the same photograph, there is a silent sorrow mapped on his face, and this sorrow is mine too. Griffin poignantly conveys how long the power, mystification, and shutdown of cutoffs can last in a family. Unresolved family relationships may continue to impact us long after the person is gone. As one patient put it, through my eyes flow the tears of our whole family. Robert Anderson, in his play I Never Sang for My Father, makes the comment, Death ends a life, but not a relationship, which struggles on in the survivor's mind, seeking some resolution which it may never find. And the son says, what did it matter? 
if my father never loved me or I never loved him. And yet, when I hear the word father, it matters. We must make every effort to help clients resolve the issues they have with their family members. One of the major founders of the family therapy movement, Boston psychiatrist Norman Paul, was one of the first to discuss the profound impact of unresolved mourning and trauma on families. He did not learn until midlife, long after he had been describing this process, that it had affected his own family. His aunt had murdered a lover and then killed herself. The whole family had been so traumatized by the tragedy that they moved far away, changed their names, and never told their children, born right around the time, about the experience. Norman and his sister, Dev Rogers, a playwright, grew up knowing nothing of their family's traumatic history and learned it only in midlife, when an uncle's wife came to Boston from Canada and finally told Norman the history. Norm then spent years in his effort to understand what exactly had happened and how it had affected him and his family. He said that learning the truth helped free him from a darkness he had always felt but never understood in his experience of life. As clinicians, we must do what we can to validate, empower, and strengthen clients' ties to family and community and appreciate their resilience and strength for survival. We try to assess each person in terms of where they and their other family members are in the life cycle, where they've come from and what they need to maximize their potential for dealing in the best way possible with their current and future lives, relationships, and connections to their community and to society.